Hello and welcome to this lecture about fairness. So fairness has been in the news quite a bit and for good reason, right? Because if our data has issues, if our models have issues, and if we start to automate human decisions, then any problems that could be inherent to the models, to the data, will actually then get codified in algorithms and affect a large number of people. There's this very admittedly silly joke about if you want to do stupid things, well, you use a human. If you want to do it many times, you use a computer. And well, to some extent, that's true. And not just stupid things, but also things that are maybe undesirable. So this means that as machine learners, it's our responsibility to use the best of our knowledge and our best talent to design models that actually are fair and that don't harm people. So let's look at some ex examples of where people thought that models were unfair or that something unfair was going on. So if you look at the UC Berkeley student admission rates, right? So you look at men and women and you can see that, well, there's a clear discrepancy and it's a very famous example that basically, you know, about 9% more men than women were being admitted to UC Berkeley. And quite obviously, if you look at that, so there are fewer women applying to university and out about half the number and out of that number, even fewer are being admitted. Um, it feels like something is terribly wrong, right? So when in 1973, the university saw those numbers, they actually told their statistics department to look into this. And they did. And so what they did is they looked at the various departments and they looked on a per department basis, how many men or women were being admitted. And well, there were a couple of outstanding examples, right? So there's this one department, actually there are those two departments, A and B. And a lot of men apply to those. And well, about two thirds get admitted, but actually significantly more women get admitted. Okay, so this sounds good. The other thing is that for all the other parts here, right? you can see that actually women tend to be admitted at the same probability, maybe slightly higher, sometimes slightly less, but overall with a very similar probability. Furthermore, if you look at that, the number of women applying to those very selective um, departments, right? so department F, for instance, is super selective, right? So it, only has a 7% admissions rate and it's 7% for women, 6% for men. Or, you know, then you look at department E, that's, you know, equally challenging. Actually, the number of women that apply to those departments is relatively high, whereas the number of women applying to the, well, supposedly easy departments that admit the majority of all applicants is quite low. So spoiler alert, these tended to be the STEM departments. Whereas these departments ended to ended up being something like language and arts and language and arts and, you know, I guess music or philosophy, but basically departments where the number because they, they were small departments, so they admitted few people and disproportionately women applied to those. And so the reason that fewer women than men were being admitted was that women were just applying to those much more challenging departments that, well, were not admitting that many people. And so in aggregate, therefore, there were a smaller fraction of women than men admitted <clears throat> and no bias was found. So what this shows you is that, first of all, if you have such a discrepancy 
you absolutely need to look into it. These are numbers that, at first glance, should make everybody uncomfortable. But once you've dived more deeply into it, well, you can actually see that things aren't as dire as it seems. And in fact, you know, everything is quite reasonable. You could even argue that, for instance, here in Department A, 20% high admissions rate for women, women are being, if anything, slightly favored. Or maybe there were only, you know, very strong candidates were applying, right? So what that clearly shows you that something that may seem unfair at first glance may not be at second glance. And this became so famous that it got the name, namely Simpson's Paradox. Now here's an interesting thing. If you were to partition on a per department basis, this even further, you could quite frequently then find reverse conditioning the other way around again. So turns out that by conditioning and conditioning further, you can quite often flip those ratios. And so you have to be very careful in terms of how you draw your conclusions. Um, this is a more recent example. And uh, that article in ProPublica really got the community thinking. So they looked at incarceration recommendations and bail recommendations based on essentially statistical tools that look at a, well, a possible defendant's um, record, like, you know, have they been arrested before? Have they been committed, convicted of a crime? Do they live with their parents? Are they married? And all those things. And they use this to then infer whether to send somebody to jail or whether to grant bail. And what the ProPublica analysis concluded, not saying found, but what they concluded was that there is significant machine bias against minorities. And so this is from the COMPASS study in ProPublica, and it's worth reading this article. And basically what they did is they looked at risk scores and they found that for black defendants, they were fairly uniformly distributed across the risk scores, whereas for white defendants, it was, well, something that peaked at one, and one is lowest, 10 is highest. And so therefore, if they decided to, you know, send everybody to jail below a certain, above a certain risk score, well, that unfortunately meant that, you know, this looked worse for black defendants. Now it turned out that the, if you look at labeled higher risk, but didn't reoffend, that that proportion was lower for white and higher for African American and labeled lower risk yet did reoffend. That was higher for whites and lower for African Americans. So that if you just look at, you know, these two uh, diagrams, and those four numbers would suggest very, very clearly that something is badly rotten in the way how, you know, black and white defendants are being treated and that there is evidence of discrimination. I'm delib deliberately being careful about this would suggest, because as we'll see later on, there's actually in some cases a reasonable explanation for what's going on. But for that, we need a lot more statistical tooling to really analyze this and understand. Okay, so let me just walk you through some more examples. So there's a paper or the position paper by Lambrecht and T Tucker from the FTC. And what they did is they wanted to find out whether there was a male-female bias in terms of which ads are being displayed. And they did a actually a clever experiment. They designed some generic ad, STEM careers, information about STEM careers, and they ran it. And they looked at what fraction of, you know, ads went to men and women, and, you know, what their clicks were. And, well, basically, they then concluded, uh, and I would say it's, you know, it's very much their conclusion, that really this paper doesn't need any complex analysis. And I would argue that they couldn't have been more wrong. 
So for instance, I mean, there are obvious things such as, well, you know, for instance, is there a larger supply of men than women? You could immediately see that if that were the case, then yeah, okay, more men than women are being shown ads, right? So for instance, if men happen to, you know, surf the web more while they're working, whereas women are working diligently, then, or, you know, maybe are homemakers, then, you know, that would immediately tell you that there is a much higher supply of a male audience in terms of, you know, that could potentially be shown the ads. There could be other reasons. Um, so basically, it's very easy to find discrimination, right, and bias. But it's not that easy then to actually perform a conclusive analysis. So I don't have all the data that went into this analysis, but I can very much tell you that, and this is really cut and pasted from their slides. So really this paper doesn't need any complex analysis. Well, it may or may not be true, but I think it does deserve some more complex analysis. Here's another example. This is more thoroughly researched, so bias in lending. And if you follow the link, it's a fairly detailed analysis about, you know, whether um, depending on ethnicity, you were actually being granted or denied uh, credit. And while this matters, because if you want to, you know, build up wealth, one of the most effective ways of doing so is if you buy some property, because then you essentially can live there without paying rent and you have all the tax savings from not having the rent money taxed. Essentially, you can tax deduct uh, the interest there. So there are lots of tax reasons why it's advantageous to own rather than to rent, at least in the United States. And so therefore, if you know you are in a minority and well, at the same credit score while your credit is being denied more frequently, you could conclude from that that maybe there is bias. And I'm saying maybe because the story is actually a little bit more complex, right? So what they did is um, they actually didn't just look for, you know, lending um, at the you know, credit rating, but also what collateral is available, what the debt to income ratio is. And then, so they actually looked at, you know, why, you know, credit is being denied or approved. And <clears throat> it's clear that, um, for instance, the debt to income ratio, you know, plays a role for some demographics, right? Like if you're Asian, a Pacific income uh, Islander. Also, the collateral plays a clear role, right? So, if you look at that, the for blacks, for instance, and Native Americans, it's lower than for whites, and that may also factor into it. So, what I'm getting at is, besides the credit rating, there is a number of other factors that play a role in deciding whether essentially a loan is approved or not. And whether there is truly bias in lending, the proper study would require that you look at those attributes. So for instance, what may happen is that due to generations of racism um, and also discrimination, you may have a situation where a minority has less, well, basically collateral uh, available just because their parents were poor. So now if you go and apply for a loan, well, then you're probably also poor. You can't put up a large collateral. As a result of that, well, you're not going to get the loan even if your credit rating is high because the bank isn't satisfied that they would have enough collateral to, you know, have recourse if you cannot pay. Now, this is now, so in, in this case, the cause isn't the racism of the lending approval algorithm, but it has to do with a long-term discrimination against certain groups, <clears throat> which unfortunately then perpetuates inequalities in many cases over generations. 
Okay, let me give you an example of where this actually happened. So redlining <clears throat> was a very clearly racist strategy for keeping, in this case, African Americans out of wealth. So this is in the 1930s. Location was basically used to approve credit, and they basically decided that those red regions, hence redlining, so these regions here, right, and here, actually a lot of those were inner city regions, this is in Philadelphia, that they were not supposed to be given credit, whereas some of the outskirts, right, so these areas here, you know, it said, you know, best or still desirable, um, they were given credit. And in many cases, the decisions as to how to label this were made based on just a racial markup. In other words, if the area was almost entirely white, then it was, you know, the best neighborhood. And if it was mostly African-American, then it was a hazardous neighborhood. And unfortunately, the banks then used this information to decide where to give credit. And unfortunately, if you don't have credit, then you cannot invest in the neighborhood, the neighborhood declines. And so you would say, well, okay, this was in the 30s, we're way beyond that, well, we are way better, and it's, you know, 90 years later. Well, it turns out <clears throat> that these things can do damage even almost a century later. So if you look at the fraction of African Americans in a neighborhood, and you look at the amount of lead <coughs> poisoning in that neighborhood, you see that for whenever you have a high, when you have a high fraction of African Americans, then that percentage of lead poisoning is high. So how does that relate to <coughs> what I just mentioned before about redlining? Actually, it's quite serious because what happened is that lead poisoning comes from lead paint. And to abate uh, lead paint, to remove it, to replace it with something else, to maybe replace the entire house, requires money. And it turned out that since in those neighborhoods it was hard to get credit, they didn't invest, or rather were not able to invest in these measures. So the lead, st lead paint stayed on. And even in 2017, there are still quite a few neighborhoods with houses with lead paint. And since the demographic markup of a neighborhood doesn't necessarily always change drastically, at least many traditionally African American neighborhoods remain that way, even 80, 90 years later, it just so happened that the poorest neighborhoods that were most discriminated against almost a century ago were still at a disadvantage now. And this is why you see the lead poisoning. And you would probably be able to see similar statistics for other attributes. What I'm trying to tell you is that there is a lot of responsibility and a lot of damage that you can do if your algorithms are inappropriate. And I can only strongly recommend everybody to think about it when they apply machine learning to situations that can affect people's lives. Now, what you can clearly also see from this statistic here is that, well, it's not that the latest discriminating against African Americans, but basically injustice was done a century ago, or maybe over, you know, many decades, up to a century ago. And that now still has effects now. Now, the fair thing to do isn't necessarily one that you can fix with statistics. This is a political decision, and I'm, this is not a political science lecture, so it's not me to, you know, recommend one way or another. But basically, what I can at least tell you is that you really should take these issues very, very seriously, because if you don't, you can do damage for generations. There's a lot of reading material that went into those slides. I've pulled out some of the 
more relevant ones, probably the very best one is the ICML 2019 tutorial from Corbett Davis and Girl. Um, I've actually quite liberally borrowed some slides from that. Um, you should really go through their full tutorial. It's like a three hours lecture or so. There's a really great um, review paper from 2018 uh, from Hutchinson and Mitchell. And essentially it, what they've done, and this is great scholarship, right, is to draw the connections between the fairness research now and what happened about 50 years ago when a lot of those questions were being raised. So this, remember, this is 1960, 1970. Remember, Simpson's paradox was 1970. And what they show is that even then already, um, people realized that different criteria and requirements of fairness are not always compatible with each other. And that sometimes you need to, you know, be, you know, considerate as to what you want, but also that looking at the impact at the outcomes of, you know, these decisions is really important. There's a nice paper by Fazalpur and Lipton, and it's, well, somewhat machine learning and somewhat on the uh, political philosophy side. It's actually quite a refreshing take in the sense that it argues that you need to actually look at the specific problem at hand rather than postulating idealistic in the, uh, criteria for what amounts to being fair or not. And that if you do the latter, you may actually entirely miss the unfairness or at least you will not be able to fix it properly. And there's one more paper by Wachter, Mittelstadt and Russell. And if you have a second degree in law, you should really read this paper. It's basically written by some legal scholars and machine learners. Um, again, it's a really strong paper. These should help you get a little bit of a grounding. And I guess I've pretty much given it away a little bit in the very biased choice of reading material where I'm going to go with this lecture, namely that you probably cannot have a magic device which will just happily automate and give you fairness. And that obsessing too much about a specific mathematical formulation may be the wrong way to go about the problem. But that at the same time, there are really good statistical tools that you can use to question at least whether what you're doing is fair and whether it harms people. So let me conclude this with a little bit more of legal context. So there are actually laws and they differ between countries about what you can do or cannot do. So for instance, there is a federal law against discrimination and I'm not going to read you this entire part, but basically there are the obvious things like race, color, religion, national origin or sex. Later on, it was also added, age was added. So for instance, you cannot discriminate against old people like me, or you cannot discriminate against people with a disability. So <clears throat> all of those things are clear, but discrimination doesn't always just mean a bad thing. It also means that it's sometimes not that easy to discriminate in favor of some groups and so affirmative action is probably about as far as you can go. This is a bit different in the European Union. And well, the law is, uh, well, quite verbose. So there's the GDPR and the recital 71 has a lot of details in there. Again, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but this is a dynamic field. And with dynamic field, I mean that, for instance, recently in the in New York, um, there is a law being debated whether AI hiring tools um, should or should not be used, or you know, uh, and especially if they are being used, whether they need to prove that they are not being biased. And unfortunately, in some cases, it's very easy for somebody to say. Well, I want your algorithms to be fair and unbiased, right? This is, you know, something we can all get behind. But what that actually means 
is a lot more up for debate. And as a matter of fact, if you look at the entire uh, fairness community, there is a lot of work, a lot of good work that takes a very diverse set of stances on what actually amounts to being fair or unfair. And I think it's important to keep that in mind when you go and say, well, I designed a fair algorithm. So um, with that, I think we are now ready to look at specific tools to assess fairness.